Welcome to the Thought Leadership Podcast, where we share insights on how you can become the go-to thought leader in your niche. I'm your host, Alejandro Sanoja, founder and personal branding consultant at Latin Presarios. And today, our guest is Sarah Macris. As someone who has held leadership positions in publicly listed companies, such as Kohl's and NAB, Sarah understands the challenges her clients face. Perhaps no one notices how hard you work or how much you contribute. Maybe you feel underappreciated despite being a linchpin in your team that delivers essential results time and again. And she understands how frustrating it is to be overlooked for roles and not understand why other people are getting promoted ahead of you. For 20 years, Sarah helped her employers, some of the largest corporations in Australia, to amplify their reputations as leaders in their industries. She developed campaigns that showed their CEOs to be among the sharpest in the game. Now, Sarah uses the same corporate communication techniques in her proven coaching framework. Coaching high-level executives through the framework, she helps them to reach their full career potential. With her coaching and tools at your disposal, you'll be able to make waves in the right professional circles, articulating who you are and the professional value you bring. Sarah, it's so great that we're here today having this conversation because we connected due to a post that you made that is an idea that it has been resonated in my head recently. And it was about, it's not about who you know, but who knows you. And that completely flips everything we've been hearing about. You have to grow your network. You have to know the right people. What is behind that thought of, it's not about who you know, but who knows you. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because for me, I find that um, one of the things that I found when I was working in corporate was that I was often called by recruiters and they would say, um, you know, are you interested in this role? And then after, if I would say no, um, and mind you, these conversations are happen- happening everywhere, uh, they, would, uh, they would then say, well, okay, that's fine. Um, is there anyone you could recommend? Is there anyone else you know who might be? Um, interested in this role and so you really want to be one of you want to be known well enough that some, you're, someone's recommending you that someone's mentioning your name um, so that's really where that that idea came from yeah I totally agree also because nowadays with the tools that we have available if you with a big resignation and everything right if you want to be able to grow a business exponentially at some point the number of people that knows you has to grow at a higher pace than the people you can actually meet. Because I remember yeah. when I was in business school, I moved to the US um, in Latin America, networking is not really part of, of culture. You kind of like start meeting people naturally, but you don't really um, think of it as, as something to do. So here uh, we were doing it all the time and we have to, and I met a lot of people. I think I went from I don't know, 200 LinkedIn connections to 2000 in those two years. So I definitely met a lot of people that, that I actually knew, but then at some point it's, you start to think about, okay, how do I, how do I best use my time now with like no commute? It feels so good to save all those Mm -hmm. hours. So I think I definitely agree that by building a personal brand, by creating content, you create that impact still do yeah. the events, still do your focus networking, but by leveraging yeah. the digital tools, that number of people that know you can grow higher than the people that, that you know. Yeah, I, look, I think that's a really good point too, is without um, building your personal brand, without creating content that um, and, and sort of showing people what it is that you can bring to the table, uh, it's very hard to build that sort of, you know, um, network just, just on your own. <laughs> Correct. Sarah, I was curious because in part of your process in helping executives land their dream job is picking a niche. And we've heard this, of course, in many different, in business, in any area, it's kind of like, be sure that you're focusing on a niche. Mm. But how do you advise a senior executive to pick a niche? Because I'm thinking, okay, if you're a senior executive, you have domain expertise in in what you do, right? Like you're a CFO, you know, finance. You are a CEO, you know, operations. CMO, you know, marketing. But then maybe I know people like 
that specialize in an industry and they just work in that industry. So they know their domain expertise in that industry, but there's people that switch and they yes. go to different industries. So if, if you're advising someone to pick a niche, how mm -hmm. does that conversation go? And what are the variables you move to, to better understand what's going to be the best choice? Yeah. Okay. So um, first of all, it starts off with, you know, where do you want to go? What's the next few years look like for you? So are you staying in marketing if you're a CMO or are you move, wanting to move to um, one of my clients? Uh, she had been in sort of like a tech, she was in a shared services area. So she was the chief shared services officer. So she had all of the different, you know, shared services under her and she really wanted to move into a completely different field. So um, her goal in the next couple of years was to move into a technology slash robotics space um, area. So for her, that was about saying, okay, well, I want to go there, but this is where I am. And for others, it's just about, I want to get a promotion. I want to be, um, you know, moving to that next company. So start with the goal, which is really important because then you can really sort of identify what niche you are actually targeting. But then within that, it's about saying, well, what is it that I want to be known for? And what is it that I'm really good at? And within a packet uh, like a, a department such as marketing there are so many different areas you know it could be brand storytelling it could be um, um, advertising it could be um, you know customer experience so there's so many different elements of that and so what I really encourage my clients to do is to say well what is it that you actually want to be known for what is it that really lights your fire and what are your earned secrets around those things so what is it that you know so well and you could talk about for hours uh, and really kind of get um, get more knowledgeable on that area and go drill right down into it. So that, that is your space. And, um, and I find that's probably, that, that's definitely the way that I approach it. Would you say that they should have kind of like a core uh, topic or niche that they, or expertise that they always talk about? Because it's so hard to get, we think people get tired of listening to what we do in our message but actually yeah. probably most people, most super close people to you don't even know exactly what you do, <laughs> right? So you have to repeat it and repeat it. Yeah. So knowing that, how would you advise to rotate those topics, right? Do you, do you stick with the, your domain expertise and maybe the two other uh, areas where you want to go in the next years for X amount of time? Or do mm. you... Um, have one or two that are always there and then maybe ro rotate the third one related to that goal that, that you want to achieve? Why do you think it's a good rule of thumb um, when, so I, I think, when yeah, doing when so? Go ahead. The, yeah, when it, when, it, um, when it comes to the content, I always think it's um, best to start with, you know, an overarching, uh, an overarching um, theme. And then it's about, okay, so what within that are sort of um, subcategories? that you could talk to. And then, um, for example, one of my um, previous clients was had lost her role. She ended up in an unfortunate situation during COVID and she was right in the middle of negotiating something and it all sort of fell apart the day COVID um, really hit the news. So um, she found herself out of a role. She'd been there for a long time. And um, so she needed, and it was in an, a big media company. So she had to try and get another role um, and she knew she was great. At, she was in sales and marketing. And so what she did was focus on when I mean, she used content really to build that sort of bridge was really about saying, OK, I know I'm really good in this space. This is where I want to go. I want to be known for marketing and sales or sales and advertising, I think it was. Um, and then what she did was grabbed all. And obviously, she didn't have work to show of her own at that point because she'd lost her role. So it wasn't like she was talking about what her company was doing. What she was doing was grabbing other people's work, other campaigns and critiquing them and using that as her content. And that was a really great way to sort of keep relevant. Uh, but when it comes to sort of prioritizing your content, I would definitely say it's about uh, subcategories and then it doesn't matter so much as long as you're sticking with the themes. So I also recommend things that are current and newsy. Um, you can look at stats, you can look at all of those things that come in that are current within your industry and then it's you don't have to be so hard and fast about specific like drill down topics because then there's a lot of topics that come under your theme it's so many great points that, that that we could pick from there um 
I want to go in the direction of how to deal with the fear of feeling like you don't know enough about something, right? Let's say, okay, I want to pivot there, but look at these, these, all these other experts I know that actually know about it, which in hindsight, a lot of people, a lot of those are not considered experts because they're not sharing their thoughts, right? Like there's a lot of people yeah. that are, that are truly deep experts and don't know that uh, are not sharing the content. And then the people that know maybe a little bit or are learning that do the work, they mm -hmm. are considered the experts. Uh, uh, one of the, the biggest known examples, I think it was Gary Vaynerchuk when, when he was in wine, he started Wine Laverty, he was a wine guy. Then he started yeah. doing marketing and people told him, stay in your lane, you don't really know about this. <laughs> now he has Vayner Media and now NFTs. So of course now it's easier for him to switch because he's done it several times and he has the confidence. But when you are advising someone that maybe they're doing their first switch to a new area, what are some of the tools that you can give them so that they uh, continue going down the path they need to go to build that expertise in that new area? So I, I believe that when you're when you're sharing content, that you're still learning every day. So I think that when you are in that situation where you don't know a lot about it, you know, you don't want to, you don't know a lot about a specific topic, but you're exploring it. It's okay to share that you're learning this on the way. And it's actually a really great and non-threatening way for um, people to engage with you. I recently got an email from um, a, a girl that I follow, um, a lady that I follow, who's a marketer. And she's just started an email sequence to her base and she's trying to explain to, she's, she's basically said, and I think this is a really fantastic approach, um, I really want to learn about Web3 and so I'm going to share with you my learnings each week. So I think that's a really great approach when you don't know a topic that well and you want to know more about it and you want to become an expert in it. Um, because let's face it, there's a lot of industries right now that there aren't, there aren't real experts because they've only been around for a couple of years. So how can you call yourself an expert really, um, or, or sort of topics? So showing your learning journey is a great way to approach that. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a typical fear. Um, how to deal with kind of like the typical imposter syndrome. Now, I imagine there's another one. I think that if you're building your personal brand and you are a founder or owner, that's kind of like easier. But if you're building a personal brand as an executive in a company, mm -hmm. I imagine that there might be a fear of having others think that you're putting yourself above the company. So how do you how do you help people find that balance and and also become an advocate for themselves so that they can keep doing the work while still thinking or understanding that that's going to be the benefit the company as well so there's a few things in there i suppose what some some companies uh, you know, that you might work for. So if you're in real estate or you're in um, a really sales focused role, then it's going to benefit you to build your personal brand and anything that you do around that is going to benefit the company. So also lawyers, partners in law, law firms, that's a really another great example. But if you're an executive who is within an organisation and you don't really need to build your profile as in, in terms of what the company would see, they would think, well, you're in, you know, head of operations, why do you need to build your brand? So sometimes there is that clash. But the reality is, is your career is not um, given, you know, it's not a certainty. So you, you're, that job you're in today. So you really need to think of yourself as, um, you know, the CEO of your career and, and be thinking, okay, so that's, I like to think about, like, that's my client right now. I'm working for this company. But really what happens if they send me an email tomorrow that no longer you're working for this company? So you've really got to be thinking like a few steps ahead um, and building that, that, um, that sort of insurance or that, that those lifelines <laughs> outside of the next role. So when it comes to building that sort of personal brand within your organisation, I think you need to think about, you know, what is it that I need out of this organisation? Like what is it that I need for my goals and my career? And then also thinking, okay, so how do I, this is actually going to benefit my company because I'm going to attract more business if that's the sort of space you're in. Or I'm going to set myself up well for my future and also potentially, you know, move up the chain. Because a lot of people 
um, believe or, or unfortunately sort of falsely believe that you are um, that, that you've got to work harder and that's actually not the case you know you don't have to be you know be working more and more hours to get noticed what you really need to be is once you get to that top level it's a given that you've got those skills you know you've got to you've got you know you're one rung below the, the chiefs um, the c-suites and the next step is not about whether you know your job well enough it's about how much influence you have and whether you're seen as a leader so there's another really compelling reason for why you need to build your brand and sometimes the focus really is internally building that brand within the organization and less about building it externally. You bring up a, a great point, Sarah, and I had it in my list next, so we're kind of <laughs> aligned. Yeah. Um, because it's that point about working hard versus working hard and smart, right? Yes. You just said there's a lot of people focus on, oh, I need to get a, another certification. I need to get an MBA. I need to get an MBA and a law degree and a CFA and all these things, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. In into a to an extent, you need you might need some of those in hmm. some scenarios, yeah. right? But how? What are some of the the typical fears that you see there? Where does mm -hmm. that story come from? Mm -hmm. For yeah. some people, um, it's super easy. They say. Um, it's kind of like a cliche, but I think the, the stats back it that people who are closer to sociopathy and 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 and, and psychopathy get do really great as executives because they kind of right. like they feel more comfortable faking it till you make it kind of yeah. thing, right? Uh, versus the people that no 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 until I'm really sure that I can get this done. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it or think that I can do that job, right? Yeah. So how does that conversation go about when you are, when someone wants to land their dream job, but they don't feel comfortable, how do you work with them so that they can work on being seen while also working on improving the skills and everything else that it's also needed to be a good mm -hmm. leader? Look, I think a lot of people suffer from imposter syndrome. In fact, look, most people do at some point in their life. And it's quite common, particularly for high achievers. So if you're, you know, really good at what you've done, like what you do, there will there'll probably be a point in time where you say, oh my gosh, like, can I really do that? Or just doubt yourself. And that's quite natural. So it's about sort of saying, yes, I can acknowledge that feeling. Um, but here's all the reasons why I know I can do this. So it's, again, I believe that that honing in on what it is that you're really great at and the value that you bring is critically important. And then, you know, Mac sort of amplifying what it is that you want to be known for. So, you know, creating um, a brand around those things. So that's one sort of point, but just on the, um, the other, the other point you raised, which was how do you, how, you know, people sort of, if you're comfortable in the studying space, it's quite natural for you to want to um, think, okay, um, oh, I need another degree. But often that's that's exactly what you don't need <laughs> because you've got all the the education. It's just that nobody knows about you. So so I I, I've, I think a lot of people fall into that trap. And I often said I've actually had um in Australia and I'm not sure what it's like over there in the US, but um, we have a company directors course which a lot of um, a lot of executives do. So you have to do this course. You don't have to, but it's preferred um, in order to sit on a board. And a lot of um, people will ask me, should I do, should I build my personal brand or should I do this company director's course? Which one should I do? And I always say, well, you know, really the personal brand has to be there um, all the time. You know, you have to be constantly building that brand because once you get that corporate company director's course, it's sort of just great, you've got it. But if nobody knows you've got it, then you're not going to be able to find a board role. <laughs> so, um, so, and it's exactly the same with an MBA and any other sort of qualification. Um, so, yeah. Sarah, we've talked a lot about personal brand and I feel like that's such a big topic and there's so many ways of achieving that visibility, right? It's, I believe that in essence, personal brand is about having a reputation and, and making sure that it expands beyond your circle, that a lot of people know about yeah. you and what you do and the value that you can create. But there's many ways to do so, right? I think 
there's a, a misunderstanding of what it is because we see so many influencers that they're just entertaining and people think, yeah. oh, that is a personal brand. And they don't think, oh, but Ray Dalio has been doing a lot of work with his principles book and other things. And he's also building a personal brand in a completely yeah. different way. So what are, when you define the process of building a personal brand, what is the typical avenue that you take? If we think, oh, you could do PR and just appear on, on television mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. outlets, you could, um, I don't know, try to do um, like a TV show, you could uh, create content, you could just do speaking engagements. What is that avenue that you recommend executives take to build that personal brand? Yeah, okay. So first of all, I think everybody who is in the corporate space should have, uh, and I think about it in, in, in a pyramid or a triangle. At the bottom, you'd have, you know, you're a really, really good, up-to-date, relevant currency CV, resume, and you'd have a LinkedIn profile that really is excellent. And I'm, unfortunately, I still see LinkedIn profiles where I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, does this person care about their career because it really doesn't, or are they, you know, even working still? So that those two sort of are like, you must have. <clears throat> and then you would move into other, you know, the next level, which might be content creation on LinkedIn and, and, you know, unique content, not just sharing things, but, you know, really stuff that you've created and that you're, um, you've got your thoughts around. Uh, and speaking at industry events is, an, is, is a really important, potentially putting things in, um, um, contributing to industry publications. So really sort of honing that industry space. Then it's about saying, okay, so what's the next step for that? And that could look like more, it could look like, you know, radio, media, um, um, podcasting, um, you know, going on podcasts or going on TV or, and then it could be a book at the top. So, and also sort of media would fall into that space. So that's the way I sort of approach it. And obviously you, you need to have all the foundations under that before you even start, because if you don't have a clear message and you don't know who you're talking to uh, and why you're even doing it, then, um, then that makes it very difficult. <laughs> then you're just doing it for the sake of it. Sarah, we are aligned. My next question is exactly about what you mentioned. Um, let's go deeper into that, that baseline, the base of the pyramid that you just described. I totally agree with what you said about LinkedIn. Could you please share with us what are some of the most common LinkedIn mistakes that you see out there? That you see a profile, maybe it's a super high profile, super experienced executive, and then you look at the LinkedIn profile and you just want to cringe. Um, it happens. It does what, are, happen. what are some of those mistakes? Um, so, I mean, there's just the basic ones, right? It's, that I the sort of straight away, your first impression, you know, you've got a really bad photo. It's, I mean, the worst ones I've seen at the wedding crops. They're, um, they're really bad. And I, I, I can't believe people still do them, but they, they're, they're around. Um, so the wedding crop or just an unprofessional photo that's, um, that's out of date. So either unprofessional as in it's just been a cutout or it's so old that it's sort of, you know, it's, it's kind of looks like it was taken 10 years ago. Um, then you've got things like banners. Banners these days, no one should be having the LinkedIn default banner. You should have, you know, should have something there that represents you. But most importantly, um, I mean, I, look, I, I mean, no recommendations. That's another one that I think is 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 important. Having under five hundred connections, um, and no matter what, you know, I'm not I'm not into the sort of vanity metrics. But when it comes to an executive, you must have more than 500 connections um, because it just doesn't look like you're active at all on the platform. Uh, and also a bio. I mean, bio, I could go on about bio forever, but bios are about, you know, being forward focused and talking about what you can do, you know, what value you can bring. But unfortunately, a lot of the time I see bios that are about, this is what I've done. This is all the stuff I've done. Um, you know, hashtag, hashtag, hashtag. So, um, that's, yeah, that's a, another common mistake. I've probably gone over five. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but, no, that's great. Go ahead. As many as you want. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I always, um, I always say too, is that, you know, when someone Googles your name, your LinkedIn profile is the first, often the first, thing, unless you are some major media darling, it's the first thing that comes up. So, um, you know, whether you're active or not. So it really does pay to, um, 
to have a really good and well optimized LinkedIn profile. And when you're meeting with somebody, and, we, and it's it's incredibly common. I mean, I would say nearly everybody would do it. You know, you're meeting with people from a, another um, another company. You're going to go to LinkedIn at some point, whether that's after the meeting or before the meeting, to find out a little bit more about those people that you met with or are meeting with. And um, you really, you, you know, you want to be representing yourself in the best light. Yeah, I totally agree. Let's let's get tactical for just a second. What when you see that? Okay, you're working with someone, and you recommend, hey, um, photo, banner, those kind of like design yeah. elements. What are your typical recommendations on on what they should do next to make sure, for example, they have a good banner? Is it um, using Canva that I think it's great. And nowadays it's an amazing tool where if you're not a designer, you can get something out there decent. Um, mm -hmm. is it working uh, with that designer on Upwork? What does that process look like from having a not so good profile to at least having a, a baseline profile? Yeah. So I like to not like sort of pull it down to 15 steps. And I think that, you know, you start sort of right at the top of the page, but always with the banner. And, and I think it depends on how tech savvy you are. And being in the online world, we, we, we're we used to dealing with these tools all the time, but a lot of people aren't. So even if you just have a blank, I would say if, it's, if tech is not your thing and Canva just looks way too hard, then um, just go with a blank colour or a picture that, because LinkedIn will size them up for you. So that's sort of step one if it's if it's you know not something you want to do but canva is fantastic especially if you're a business owner and you want to have um some um you know some text in there but otherwise a picture of something that you that relates to you it could be a city a place you've been i've had people you know do mountain climbing pictures and all sorts of stuff i mean it just brings something worth people it, it just creates a point of conversation as well and the next thing i would say would be um the title, the headline, and there's a bit of, I've noticed there's quite a bit of, there's a bit of a trend at the moment. I don't know if you've noticed this yourself, but where people are sort of doing, it's really hard to see what they do. There's just sort of keywords, lots of keywords. And um, I find that, I, I personally don't recommend that. I, I recommend, you know, a statement uh, and then, then a couple of keywords of key areas that you focus on. So maybe it's, you know, your, your three areas of what you want to be known for, like leadership, um, innovation, and I don't know, like ESG or something that's related to, um, uh, you know, corporate social responsibility, whatever it is that your sort of niches are. And then, um, and then sort of expanding on that from there if you want to. But, but being really clear about what it is you do, because I often find if you're an executive and you want people to know, that you, you do need to actually say, you know, executive. <laughs> because otherwise you, you just you just don't know. Are you an executive? Are you, do you work on your own? Are you, you know? So I think that's, that's another, another one. Uh, uh, the bio, I've mentioned that. And that, again, that's about, you know, I always think, put some examples in there as well of great, you know, I am this, this, and this, this is the kind of stuff I can do. Here's an example, a recent example of what I've done rather than I've led this, I've done that. I've So sort of that. And then um, what's the next section on there? The recommendation. Oh, I think the other, the other tip I would say is the work history should not look like a resume, add some media. And uh, especially if it's been in the media or if you've got videos or a uh, white paper and recommendations are uh, your friend. The more you give, the more you get and um, a one to three ratio is always good there. Yeah, and I will add another one that I actually stole from you and your profile, which is I love how you have a great cadence of growing in value in your feature section. So, cause I've seen this, a lot of people doing this where they don't have a website, their LinkedIn profile is their website. And I think right. it's a great idea, right? Like if you're starting in, 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 yes. a, in an executive case, it might not apply, but if you're selling some type of coaching or consulting, uh, or it could be an executive, let's say, while they're, they, were, uh, they lost a job and while they're um, figuring out their next move, they could do this which is people use their LinkedIn as a landing page. And what they do in the feature section is what you have done great, which is 
um it's something like value value and call to action and so you have there your book a call your guide and i think it's a a, a, a book then a course and and then kind of like the full program which i think it's great because then people can choose okay here are all the different ways in which um, she can help me and through the content and everything else you you build that um get get them to know you and like you and trust you and then that's when they're ready to to take the next step so i would definitely include that i just switch my feature section after after uh, taking a look at at yours now sarah oh, I yeah it's great it's such a good area i want to ask you also about how to how would you recommend people to engage on LinkedIn and what's some of the low hanging fruit? Because something I've learned recently is that um, in an, another podcast guest recommended to take take back, I guess, um, sometimes I struggle with English, take back the, the invitations that you send. Because if you have a lot of pending invitations, the, the algorithm might flag you as a spammer. So she recommended, hey, every once in a while, go take a look at your your outstanding pending invitations. If it's if it's been there for several months, just like take it back and maybe send it again after a comment. So I I did the exercise that she recommended. It it worked great to connect. But something I noticed is that if I see a profile and it's a let's say a decent profile. But I go to the recent activity and they haven't engaged in months. That person is not going to connect with me. That person is just someone that has LinkedIn as a resume. They yes. never use the platform. They probably have hundreds of notifications, hundreds of messages, <laughs> and they're not going to see yours, right? Yeah. So you definitely don't want to be that person if you're mm -hmm. going to rely on, on LinkedIn as a tool to not only put yourself out there, but connect with people. So... Mm -hmm. For that person that's getting started, maybe they're getting a little bit overwhelmed. Oh, like, do I have to create video and speak and yeah. write? Like, what is it that I have to do to, to be known? Yeah. Maybe this is too much yeah. work. What are yeah. some of your first step, uh, low-hanging fruit recommendations to start having a little bit of activity on that yeah. recent activity tab? I think that's a really interesting point because I know um, so some sometimes I've come up with cl clients who've, who've told me that a recruiter has had a look at their LinkedIn profile and um, so I've heard this from recruiters I've heard this from clients I've heard this from different people um, and they've seen a you're not connected to anybody that um, and so therefore the you're not you're not going to make the shortlist uh, that's a big one the other one um, is uh, you so recruiters going in and doing a search you know how you can search in sales navigator that you that um recent activity in the last 30 days so you know posted content in the last 30 days and if you haven't posted content in the last 30 days you may not come up in a search for a um a role so that's another reason to be out there doing at least some content and whether that is and if the boy you can manage is a share of another of something else um that's okay as long as you pop your view on it so you know here's my key takeouts boom 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 uh and then share it so um so another reason that that's you know another reason why and i've actually even heard that for someone who was going for a role internally the internal com the company they were already working for wanted to see their linkedin profile so there's you know it's just becoming more and more in terms of low-hanging fruit, the best thing to do is to be on there every few days or daily, ideally, um, and commenting. That's that's the be the best step you could take if you if it's not, um, you know, if you're just thinking, oh my gosh, what am I? Where do I start? Commenting on people's posts, potentially sharing them, sending a DM to people that you know, reconnecting, and um, and when you get the confidence up, then posting. But um, I know that that is a big one. I don't know if you've heard that stat, Alejandro, about um. Uh, that there's only out of all of the LinkedIn people, all of the people on LinkedIn, only um, one to two percent create original content. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um, then the other thing I would, I totally agree with that. What I would add about the comments is that at least that happened to me. Is that let's say for example you post something about personal branding, five steps you can you can take to improve your LinkedIn profile, and you post five things. I would see the article and it's like, oh, that's nice. Uh, I would add this, but then I would think, 
I'm not going to post it because Sarah knows, right? Like she's a personal branding expert. Why would I post mm -hmm. this thinking that I know more than her, right? Like she probably knows. But then I realized my, my mindset shift was it's not for Sarah, it's for whoever engages in the conversation. Um, yeah. Michelle, another, another, uh, another personal branding a consultant expert that was on the show, she shared also this that helped me make that change, which is think of LinkedIn as a big networking event, right? And when someone shares a post, it's kind of like a conversation. You share your view. Oh, here are five things that you can do to start writing an article. If I have a sixth or a seventh that adds value to the conversation, just 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 put it out there. So that, that helped me because before I was like, why am I going to like, course they know right like or let's say like a leadership expert i'm like what what am i gonna share about leadership that yeah. he doesn't know it's not for the person it's it's for the conversation i agree with that and also um it's it's the it's the yes but and you know it's yes but let's do this or yes and i think this and i think that's that's great that's what we're there you know that's what that's what thought leadership's about isn't it you know it's about sharing your ideas and your views and adding to it or expanding on it yeah i wanted to go back before we move on um because this is getting interesting i want to go deeper into into that topic <laughs> of of how to engage but i want to go back to the to the topic you mentioned about the statement on your profile because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know this but that follows you everywhere mm -hmm. every time you make a post every time you comment your photo in the first part of your statement comes up so that's basically a free ad that you have and what i think happens i am not 100 uh, sure on this but i think the the divide is that a lot of people like us are advising to have kind of like a personal branding statement that communicates mm -hmm. what you do and how you serve people i yeah. am in that camp but i think that recruitment experts advice to have keywords so that they pop up in those searches. So I think, of course, I'm biased, but I think that the compromise is what you said. Hey, have this statement at the beginning so that that's your ad, your, your 50 second pitch that follows you everywhere so that you can capture attention. And then towards the end of your profile, of your statement, if you have characters left, add all those keyword yeah. dump that you want to do but towards the end so that you you have the beginning uh, dedicated to something that that they are going to see in your case you have personal branding for executives right that is going to go everywhere so pe executives are going to quickly identify with with that um yeah and and i think that's a real i i really find that quite um difficult at the moment seeing that because i think i can't i can't work out with it you know what it is that you do so <clears throat> i feel like people are missing opportunities when if it's if it's not obvious um exactly what they do the other one that i find is people often ask um i'm a you know i'm say i'm a general manager and i want to be um a chief marketing officer what do i write because i don't recommend putting your title on on your linkedin so i don't believe you should say you know gm marketing sweeps for example <laughs> uh you should be you know general manager is fine if that's the position that you are looking to go to next or that you are in at the moment but say you don't have a role and you're wanting to be and you, you don't have a role at all but you're a general manager and you want a general manager role then you should still put general manager there but i don't believe in putting your you know your actual title from work it should be more of a you know general manager marketing um general manager operations is fine but you don't need to start saying exactly the whole title. Because on LinkedIn, you know, you've got that little square in the right-hand corner that shows the company you work for anyway. Correct. And titles Correct. really only mean what, what they are in that company as well. Yeah, and I think that in terms of, of, S, of LinkedIn SEO, you just have to have like the keyword you want to pop up for. If you mm -hmm. have it on several places, it's going to yes. pop up. So, so you definitely don't need to keyword stuff, everything. Like if you have a skill, a recommendation an experience in, in some type of position, you, you should pop up um, mm. when those searches come up and you can check. Uh, there's um, 
some of the data that LinkedIn shares shows you in how many searches you appeared yes. in the past yes. week and in for which keywords. So you can definitely uh, play around with things so to make sure you're showing up in the in the things you want to show up. So Sarah, um, you I know you have in your process to one of your steps is to identify the the opportunities that are there available to build your visibility. So how you'd recommend people to get started identifying those opportunities to build their visibility? So first of all, I um, I recommend that people start with, you know, who are the key stakeholders in their in their world? So they've got this goal and they know what they they know where they're going. And now it's about saying, well, who are the people in my um, space that actually have influence? So there's people who are people who can connect me to those people. And then there's also the people who are really influential. But taking it a step further and saying, okay, so what about the people that have an influence on whether I get to the next role or I get a role? And who are those people that I need to know? And so that might look like, in ter- say, for example, within an organisation, that might look like the HR person um, who wants to get to the um, head of HR needs to be able to talk to the CFO in, a, in their language. So it's about saying, well, what are the problems that the CFO has? How do I solve them? And how do I communicate with them? So that's an internal example. But externally, it might be, okay, so my CEO <laughs> is really influenced by um, or my seat, the seat, the you know the the leadership uh, team is really influenced by um, Seth Godin, right? He every time he says something, they're talking about him. So I need to be ahead of the game on that space. I need to know what he's saying and sort of be able to talk through that. Um, so that's sort of an, an example of influences in your organisation that even though they're they're sort of uh, sorry not within your organisation, but influences externally that are that are saying things out there that your organisation or your um, stakeholders are picking up on. So really being across all that um, and identifying who who it is that can make a decision and help you get where you need to go. Because that is, it's funny, I have an exercise that I share with my clients and I always say this is the big game changer. Once you get really clear on who you need to know and who you need to sort of, um, you know, how you talk to that those people and what, how you can sort of talk about what you do that helps solve their problems. It's, it's a big shift in your brand and how you get your message across. Yeah. I think there's a great story about, I love that, that mindset of thinking about how is it that what you do solves their problem. There's a great story. I don't remember which book I read too many books probably, but um. <laughs> It was, it was George Clooney when he was trying to get his first uh, acting job and he was approaching it as, oh, I need to get the part. I need to get the part. And then he just switched his mentality to, oh, the director needs to fill the role so that he can start shooting his movie. So let me just mm-hmm. change my mindset on how is it that I can help them fill that role instead of like me getting the part. Yeah. And, and the execution probably is the same, but that mindset shift probably allows you to identify some opportunities that, that are going to help you. I also love the point about the books because it's amazing how just a little bit of work can can help you connect with someone mindfully, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you find that someone loves an, an author, you, you read the latest book, or maybe you need to read the whole book, you can watch like a short video, and then you yeah. bring it up if you're genuinely interested. That yeah. is just such a such an easy way to connect. And it feels silly and you think like, oh, it's such a persuasion tactic, but it feels good. Like when people do it, when people like post about a book and they like mention something, it, even though it might be a trick, I still appreciate that they took the time. Like even if after that they pitch to me something that they want to sell, at <laughs> yeah. least the feeling is not that bad, right? Because like at yeah. least they took the time versus when they just like generically it's like, hey, I see that you are in this industry. Do you? And it's just like, no, at least <laughs> like do a little bit more work. So yeah, I totally agree that that, that works all the time. It's um it's funny because I one one of my um one of a client I had a while back, 
uh, was really good at this sort of influencing, connecting things because she would, um, and, and I remember getting a, a message from her. You know how on LinkedIn you can say, okay, this person's connected, could provide an introduction. And she would often say, oh, I see you're connected to this person. Can you give me an intro? And I think that's something not a lot of people do, but it's a really great way to get connected to somebody that you might want to. So having a look and seeing well, who do I know in my network, even just on LinkedIn, who knows that person that I want to know and get them to introduce you. And that way it's a, it's a lot, um, a lot more comfortable. And you can Absolutely. Get a lot mm. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a, there's a different opinions on how to, on how to do so. I like to, I like to add the easy way out. Um, some people say to not do it so that if they're thinking about it, they don't take it. But usually I add the, hey, I understand if you don't feel comfortable. For example, if I'm asking for an endorsement or if I'm asking yeah, for a, yeah. a recommendation, hey, Sarah, I understand if you don't feel comfortable doing so and that's not going to change anything in, in our relationship. Um, so that if if that's the case, they kind of like have that that easy way out. Of course, just Make sure that if you're asking you you have built social capital with that person yeah, so that it, yeah. it's an it's an easy yes mm. yeah now sarah we've 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 covered a lot of steps that people have to take to build their personal brand to to be seen to mm. be considered a thought leader yeah but how long does it take right from from because we live in the era of 30 second apps and same day delivery on, on Amazon. And we want that dopamine effect of like, Oh, <laughs> I'm going to build my personal brand. Uh, click now I have it. Right. So, and it doesn't, it, it, nothing that it's valuable works that way. So okay. in your experience from the moment you make the decision, okay, I am, I am going to take action and I'm going to build my personal brand until the moment you start seeing some tangible results. Let's not call it um, maybe getting the job if you're an executive or um, getting clients if you're a business owner, um, but also not just fluff of, yeah, I got a bunch of likes and, and views that I that I didn't get before. So what are some of those tangible results that you see along the way and what should people expect in, in terms of putting the work before you actually see those results? Yeah, I, it's a great question. I think I mean, first and foremost, you have to have the right foundations um, of your brand or you really are just spinning your wheels. And a lot of people are, unfortunately, in that space because they haven't sort of invested their time and energy into, um, you know, what is it that I want? You know, what is my goal? What is my career trajectory? You know, um, a lot of my clients want to have a portfolio career um, when they leave corporate or, uh, you know, they might have a five years left or 10 year left, 10 years left to sort of nail that corporate job that they really wanted. Um, but then they want to go on to board work and a um, bit of consulting and sort of have a portfolio career. So it's a long-term plan, but they need to start um, sooner rather than later. Uh, for most people, I would say that, you know, consistency and quality. So after foundations, it's about consistency, showing up all the time and, um, and committing to it. So whether that's, you know, whether that looks like 15 minutes a day for somebody or longer, um, it will pay off. And it is that sort of cumulative effect and um, and creating content will fast track that. I, I really believe that. Uh, and I think some of the sort of, I suppose, things that you notice would be people commenting on your posts, but also people commenting to you um, in the real world, you know, and I love it when people um, ring me and say, oh, I saw this post. And, and that's when I think, oh, wow, things are starting to, you know, that's when I started realizing, wow, people are actually seeing my stuff. Yes, I'm getting likes and views, but there's the real people out there um, are actually seeing things. So um, people start to mention it to you and say, oh, I've noticed you're being really active on LinkedIn and it's great or, you know, because there's a lot of lurkers, you know, there's a lot of people who don't comment and like um, for, for all sorts of different reasons. So um, so sometimes you can think, oh, I'm sending this out and nobody's seeing my posts, but really they are. So um, people mentioning those things to you, obviously, you know, the views that you're getting on your posts will start to um, in, in, um, improve and you'll start to get connection requests from people. So they're the first sort of things that you'll start seeing. And um, and I think that most people will say, you know, that 
the more consistent and the most more um, quality that they put in, or the more time they put into things, and particularly in LinkedIn, that's 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 the most important ingredient. Is is there any? I'm curious if in the in the executive world, the corporate world, there's something like this. I call them the the negative engagement that it's a good sign. So we have, for example, it happens it happens now all the time that when I started building my profile on LinkedIn and, and posting content and getting on interviews, I started getting pitch services yes. here and there now. And now it happens so often that I don't even, uh, at first I would reply, now I don't even reply. Same with like when our website started gaining traction and yes. now we're showing up for a lot of searches. Now we get probably daily someone pitching that they want to write an article for us just right. to get a link, right? So at, at some point I would get annoyed and now I'm like, this is great. Yeah, This yeah. is a sign yeah. that someone out there is seeing your work. So it's yeah. it's kind of like a, a, a negative good sign. Uh, this of course is in the world of, of entrepreneurship and, and building a company. Uh, are there some signs like that in the executive world? Maybe a ton of like um, in recruiters pitching to you? Is there, is, does something like yeah, that happen? I think, I think you'll see, you would definitely see yourself coming up in job searches. So you'll definitely have recruiters speaking to you. I mean, if you, if you start becoming active on LinkedIn, people will also start recommending you because they will see your content and think, oh, that person talks a lot about that topic. So those calls, you know, come sort of comes back to that question that we, we talked about last, um, at the beginning, which was, you know, it's about who knows you. So, excuse me. So the more often you're showing up on LinkedIn, the more people are getting to know you. And therefore, the more chance you have of people recommending you. And you definitely will get more views on your profile. Um, and many of those will be from companies and recruiters. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Em embrace the cold yeah. pitches. It's, it's yeah. a good sign. <laughs> now, Sarah, we've talked about several many different things, right? Like executive, personal branding, building content on LinkedIn, your profile. And I'm curious, when people ask you, what do you do? What is your typical answer? Hmm. So I tell them that I'm a career success coach and I help senior executives to build powerful personal brands so that they can accelerate their careers. And this is for people who are, you know, looking to increase their professional value, safeguard their career uh, and their future opportunities and attract more of the ideal network. Is there anyone, we've had several um, personal branding experts on the show, and I love it because I have the mindset of abundance that there's more than enough um, yeah. people out there that we need to help build their personal brand. So if if there's anyone, who is that person that you can help the most more than anybody else because of, of that maybe culture fit or value fit? Mm. Who's that person that comes to mind as your as the person that you can help the most? Yeah, so I, um, my background is, is in corporate. So I spent, I've spent my whole career in corporate. So I worked with CEOs and managing directors on building their profiles um, for my whole career. Investor relations, government, um, media, crisis management, spent a lot of time in that space. So anyone who works in the corporate space um, at a senior level is really someone that I, um, that I can help. And if they're, you know, action takers, they've got something that they want to share with the world, make a bigger impact and um, really sort of hit those big goals that they have set for themselves maybe early on in their career and they're ready to sort of take that next step and fast track their career now. Well, Sarah, I want to be mindful of your time because I know you had to wake up super early for this conversation. I wasn't uh, aware that you were in Australia, um, but before, before. Uh, we we start our conversation, but before before we leave, um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? We'll link to your LinkedIn, to your website. Um, all that's going to be in the show notes and and in the page that we build. But is there anything else that you'd like to share with with the audience? Um, I suppose most importantly is to um, really sort of embrace building your profile and um, be visible. Share what you know. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about uh, building your profile and accelerating your career, then I um, definitely have some free resources on my uh, website. And I also run um, uh, free masterclasses. 
So I'm doing one, uh, I'm doing three before the end of the year. So that's another way to uh, get some get some good info on how you can fast track your career. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for sharing those resources and for this amazing conversation. And for anybody out there listening, thank you very much. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.